Once again, thank you very much for the invitation. Indeed, we are going to discuss about the new boy in town, and this new boy is supposed to be Sarah Laxon, and uh, this is my conflict of interest. Uh, let me start to set up the background. Uh, we have discussed the issue of the acute heart failure burden, and uh, this slide summarizes the current situation. There is uh, more and more hospital admissions due to heart failure, no doubt, and these are the data from Europe, and we see that uh, one year all cause mortality is nearly 20% in the best European centers, one year readmission and mortality is 50%, so one in two of patients discharged from the hospital is either dead or readmitted. And this is the summary which we made uh, some years ago with colleagues from the United States showing that actually over the last 50 years there is nothing in our hands. We have loop diuretics, vasodilators and inotropes and as Professor Hasley correctly alluded to, there is nothing which may improve mortality over the 30 days. So perhaps this is the dead end. Uh, however, I would like to challenge you a little bit this morning uh, and I would like to challenge you with a new concept uh, we wish to investigate and uh, prove that we need to change the current paradigm. And perhaps uh, the current paradigm is already discussed this, uh, during this session is that uh, short-term intervention is really not able to affect long-term outcome. And I truly believe that this is no longer true in acute settings and we would like to debate this. If you see the summary of the drugs we are using for heart failure in acute settings, there are diuretics, nitrogen, and inotropes. They are very elegantly targeting some pathophysiological background. They are improving hemodynamics. They are doing a lot of uh, positive uh, things. However, at the end of the day, they are doing nothing at the end of the day. So the effects on the long-term outcome are at the best neutral. And as you see here, there is this uh, dissociation between symptomatic improvement. Can I have one slide back, please? Uh, and uh, thank you. And uh, long-term outcome. So perhaps you should say this is biologically not possible. That intervention lasting for hours would affect the long-term outcome. So biologically not feasible. And actually, this is not true because in cardiology we have that best evidence for acute coronary syndrome. Perhaps most of you are too young to remember these two trials, GC and ISIS. And these trials uh, form the background that therapy lasting for hours, which is thrombolysis in these cases, would affect the long-term outcome of this patient with STEMI. And this is the data, these are the data from the interventional trials, showing very clearly that intervention in acute settings of uh, STEMI in experience, hence lasting not hours but minutes, is going to improve the outcome in terms of mortality and mobility. So we need to set up the background to shift the paradigm. So what is needed to shift the paradigm? Perhaps uh, John very elegantly, and I fully agree with his comments regarding the Bosimenden and also with uh, David's comments about the uh, intraortic balloon pumping, because there are several items we need to consider to change the current paradigm in the treatment of acute heart failure in order to improve the outcome. First of all, we need to a targeted approach. Uh, we should be aware that acute heart failure is a very broad description. One size would never fit all, this is no doubt. So we need to characterize patients very elegantly. There is no doubt that in 10,000 patient trial with so-called hypotensive heart failure, Vivosimendan would kill most of these people they, because they would simply would be not, not suitable for this trial. So we need to target the therapy to optimal target population. We obviously need a drug which is sort of ideal, we don't have ideal drugs. And the last point I would like to draw your attention is actually early administration of therapy. Perhaps we need to challenge our colleagues and ourselves that the concept we 
should borrow from acute coronary syndrome, the earlier the better should be also applicable for acute heart failure. In my unit, everybody rushes. If there is a heart, uh, acute coronary syndrome patient with chest pain, everybody rushes. Everybody counts a second to transport the patient, transfer him or her immediately to the cat lab. But if there is a patient with acute heart failure, nobody rushes. Particularly if there is a patient with chronic heart failure. This patient always used to have dyspnea, so lower, higher, and kind of, we don't bother. We give him a little, or her, a little bit of and we'll see, unless there is a dramatic deterioration, so nobody rushes. We need to change it. And this concept we somehow apply to the study with Serilax, in which I am going to summarize for you in the next 15 minutes, but before, I would like to summarize what serolaxin really is. As you see here, serolaxin is actually a, net, a recombinant relaxin too, which is a naturally occurring peptide uh, mediating systemic hemodynamic adaptations to pregnancy. So in other words, we learn from the mother nature, if mother nature exists. And if you see, there are special receptors for relaxin, and we truly believe that uh, this uh, hemodynamic effects, which contributes to renal and cardiovascular system, may well be useful in acute settings of heart failure. If you see here, human relaxin too is increasing cardiac output, is decreasing systemic vascular resistance, is improving compliance, protecting renal function. Uh, so all these elements together may well be easily applicable and favorable in acute settings of heart failure, the compensation. However, we should a little bit separate of this simplistic and a little bit naive approach to serolaxin because serolaxin is not only just a vasodilator. As I said, uh, we don't quite understand the biology of serolaxin, particularly in non-pregnant people. Perhaps we don't also understand in pregnant women. However, particularly in non-pregnant people, we don't understand how it works. We truly believe that it works, as I say here, via endothelin B receptor, which actually, in contrast to endothelin A receptor, vasodilates the vascular system. However, if you see here, there are a lot of complex interactions uh, finally leading to a less inflammatory signal, less fibrosis, vasodilation, and perhaps also angiogenesis. So, before we started the serolaxin program, we actually learned from our colleagues from Germany that it works hemodynamically in advanced heart failure, which I truly agree with John, is completely different than acute settings. This is the study done in Charité, Berlin, Germany, in very advanced heart failure patients with serolaxin infusion. You will see here that uh, serolaxin reduces pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, increases cap cardiac output, and improves renal function. And here are the data. It looks like a very small study, a little bit encouraging, uh, no bad safety signal, so we can continue with the program. And this is the summary of the pre-relax and relax clinical trial design. We tested and will be testing in relax too. I'm sure that you will participate in this development. We approach the rule the earlier the better. In other words, we wanted to treat these patients very early, optimally within first hours of symptoms. We evaluated symptoms. We evaluated safety. At the end of the day, we also evaluated cardiovascular mortality during 180-day follow-up. These are the data from the pilot study, small study, as you see here, uh, only 234 patients, dose finding study, uh, very positive trends, improvement in symptoms, uh, very favorable trends actually towards mortality, you see here. Obviously, you uh, don't don't even give us that sort of message with 200 patients. And I am not going to convince you that this is a really a breakthrough trial. I am going to say that for the first time we received a very good signal that it may really work also in terms of a long-term outcome. Here is the design of the bigger study in which we actually uh, 
evaluated the effect of serulaxin in 1100 patients. And just for your perusal, I would like to focus on three elements. The first one, the earlier the better, within 16 hours of the presentation, median was actually seven hours, we started therapy. I truly believe that this is really important. The second issue was uh, we wanted to have a patient somehow characterized. I don't have time to discuss this uh, vascular versus uh, cardiac failure, but we, we were looking for a parameter which could be actually easily applicable in clinical settings which could allow us to identify good candidates for serilaxin. In other words, the question you ask, John, what is the best patient? Obviously, nobody would, would benefit from the, from uh, levosimend and some people would be even killed. Uh, and the same question applies here. And we try to apply this concept of systolic blood pressure as a rough but sort of okay parameter to characterize, identify those with who would benefit at the end of the day. And finally, we made sure that we are really dealing with acute heart failure settings. This is a primary endpoint of the study, which was actually improvement in dyspnea over the first five days uh, of the follow-up. You see here that uh, doesn't work quite okay, but anyway, uh, perhaps you can see the bars uh, in favor of uh, serilaxin. In other words, uh, the benefit starts early and uh, is uh, sustainable until day five. And there is a 20% improvement in, symptom, in symptoms assessed by the VAS score. Uh, and the VAS results are actually consistent across the all subgroups. You will see here, perhaps you can't uh, from the distance, but I can, if only I can move this mouse. Uh, ejection fraction doesn't matter, so regardless of the ejection fraction it works, regardless of the blood pressure, age and uh, EGFR. And, and also what was quite important, uh, and we were criticized of this nitrate use, regardless of the nitrate use, it worked quite well. Uh, second, this second event was actually very challenging and we did not realize how challenging this endpoint would be at the end of the day. We wanted to prove that this therapy works on three consecutive endpoints, time points, six hours, 12 hours and 24 hours. You will see that numerically at each of these time points there is an improvement. However, if you take all these three together, there's a virtually numerical result. What this, what these results are showing us, that if you take into consideration dyspnea reliefs using Likert scale, there is absolutely not true what Alex Mebaza is saying that during first 24 hours virtually everybody is okay. It's actually the other way around. Actually everybody is not okay because 75% are not improving, only 25%. Sorry John, I'm not hiding this, uh, uh, but this is, this is, these are the data and all the trials are showing consistently more or less the same. 25% of the patients are constantly better from one time point to another. So we need to do a lot in terms of symptom improvement. However, serilaxin was very effic uh, efficient to, imp to improve or to prevent the deterioration. These are the results from the first five days, showing that actually there was much worse, less worsening in serilaxin group than in placebo, and it brings me to the concept of worsening of heart failure during hospitalization. This slide summarizes the number of patients during consecutive days, then during first five and 14 days of the follow-up, in terms of in-hospital worsening. In this case, uh, we defined in-hospital worsening as an event which deteriorated clinical stay, clinical course of patients who were hospitalized. This is extremely important because this endpoint is challenged, is not accepted by the regulatory agencies, and we need to discuss this. Serulaxin reduced the risk of worsening in hospital by 50%. Worsening of, in hospital worsening is actually related to long-term outcome very, very significantly, and this is the 
classical approach we need to challenge. This is our great belief that if the time passes, most of our patients would improve in white. However, as we see here, around 10 to 30 of patients develop, develop worsening of clinical conditions. They may die, they may deteriorate very, very quickly, rapidly, they may deteriorate after stabilization, they all, all, all of them would require intensification of therapy. In, one, in other words, our belief that this white line would apply to all these drugs we are evaluating is simply wrong. We need to reconsider the issue of worsening of heart failure during hospital stay. Secondary endpoint was death and rehospitalization, and we didn't see any difference in rehospitalization. This is again one of the most intriguing issues in this trial. Simply because everybody takes for granted that rehospitalization and death are going into the same direction in patients discharged from the hospital after acute episode, which is actually wrong. The data which exists in the literature whatsoever and the data we have from the RELAX are, are actually demonstrating the opposite direction. It, we need to again challenge the paradigm that hospitalization and outcome in terms of mortality are identical. For different reasons, I don't want to prolong this uh, uh, presentation, but for many reasons, this is also biologically not possible. What about the final outcome, which would somehow challenge what David said? We don't have any therapy which improved the outcome. This therapy improved the outcome. You would say only 1,100 patients. Yes, and we are testing this concept in the big study with 7,000 patients now. But in this trial, both cardiovascular mortality and all-cause death were improved by around 30% at the end of the follow-up. So there is a therapy which in this trial was proven to be effective and improved the outcome. Regarding the adverse event, we didn't have any safety uh, signal, bad safety signal, and I truly uh, agree and share, uh, share uh, John's point that hypotension if we would not put enough attention on that, would kill the trial. Hypotension is one of the key issues for patients hospitalized due to decompensation. So, beneficial effects, improvement in dyspnea, signs, symptoms of heart failure, prevention of in-hospital worsening, reduction in mortality. So, what is the background? We simply don't know, but I like very much the comment that uh, we need to investigate somehow mechanism mechanistically the reason or at least to have potential explanation why it may work during the follow-up. Here is the data showing end organ protection. The only problem I have with Levosimenda, I am sorry to say, is that there is no data that actually it protects the heart. It may well protect the renal function, which is debatable, liver function, which is debatable. However, it would not protect the heart because we don't have any study to show that levosimendan protects the heart by protection of heart damage by troponin increase. Here we have the data. We have the data showing that serilaxin protected all organs. There were less cardiac damage, renal damage, liver damage. There was a much lower uric acid level and this is quite important information and organ protection. I truly believe this is important. You can ask us. Uh, you can ask me what about hemodynamics? Do we have any data? Yes, we do. We, do. we just completed the study we published quite recently in European Heart Journal uh, in acute settings, not in chronic advanced settings, but in acute settings that uh, in which we investigated the hemodynamic effects of 20 hour infusion of serilaxin in patients randomized either to placebo of serilaxin in, in the acute settings with a hemodynamic compromise, wedge pressure above 18. And we have the evidence that actually there is an improvement in those receiving serilaxin in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, the absolute difference in, in favor of, uh, of uh, serilaxin. And also we have a very interesting information 
about the effect of seroluxin on pulmonary artery pressure. There is a great reduction by 5-6 millimeters, and this is not just a transient uh, reduction, there is a sustainable, and it's not just a follow up, uh, following the reduction in pulmonary wedge pressure, because it is a rapid decrease, as you hear, after the first 30 minutes. And it brings me to an extremely important conclusion and lesson which I learned from my colleagues who are dealing with primary pulmonary hypertension. Perhaps some of you are dealing with this very rare disease, I don't, but these people told me, look, we are observing that pregnant women, pregnant women always do better during pregnancy with this pulmonary hypertension. So perhaps this serolaxin business is extremely important here and we have another piece of evidence. So if we calculate benefit to risk ratio, we can conclude that there is an improvement in current clinical status, prevention of worsening clinical status, very important, and I truly believe that we need to investigate this. Reduction in the risk of death, both in terms of cardiovascular and or cause mortality, and pretty safe profile comparable to placebo. Obviously, I am not saying that we should not put any attention because this is an active drug. We, we before the study, we somehow developed a quite rigid protocol how to manage blood pressure drop because we expected that it would kill the child if we just leave it uncontrollable and uh, having that sort of approach the safety profile is comparable to placebo. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that perhaps we need to be ready that the current scenario of acute heart failure settings will change in the future. And maybe this uh, gloomy sort of conclusion that for the 50 years we didn't have anything will be changed after completing, not necessarily relaxed, but several ongoing trials with a different approach. Thank you for your attention. Well, intuitively, thank you for this comment, intuitively I would say you may well be right, but if only we could have one study showing that echo matters at all in acute heart failure settings, then I would love this kind of comment. I truly, I always try to persuade my fellows to study echo usefulness and practicality in acute heart failure settings whatsoever. We don't have that sort of a, uh, clear evidence and in the guidelines we are not very certain that echo as such should constitute based on current evidence a part of a clinical evaluation which would translate into the clinical decision making process. But personally I truly believe that you are right and we need to confirm it. This is just my response. Thank you very much. John is unhappy with my comments about I'm sure that. Okay, thank you for your question, Dr. Kowski. Do you want to say something, John? The population of the lax refers to another kind of places where there was an Of course. Because it's places with tires, it's called blood pressure, but also places with preservation, I think. John, I truly believe that if, based on the current understanding and the experience with levosimendon, we would focus on the proper characterization of patients, then we would have a positive trial with levosimendon, which I use very often in my clinical practice. But, you know, you can't mix all this kind of a clinical characteristics uh, and believe that you will treat a patient with systolic blood pressure of 140 and those with 85 with the same regimen with levosimendon. This is my comment. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you.